I'm going to share this uh, scripture lesson with you from the Gospel of John. Uh, since it's the same one that I read every year, because it is based on the witness of an anonymous disciple named the Beloved Disciple, it is, I must tell you, one of the most fascinating things in the scripture because it takes us as close as we can to an eyewitness account of both the crucifixion, which we talked about on Friday evening, and the resurrection, which we are talking about now, or the empty tomb. And I was thinking last night, this young man, he is anonymous, he is not John, uh, he is not someone whose name we know, I think he's quite young. He was the one standing with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and another Mary, and uh, a couple of other women at the cross, and he is the one to whom Jesus said from the cross, uh, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. I was thinking last night in one of those moments when I woke up that I had always believed that was for the sake of his mother, but his mother had four other boys besides Jesus and some sisters. We don't even know how many sisters he had, and we don't know their names. We know the names of the boys. And I was thinking that it, always thinking that it was for the sake of his mother that Jesus said that, but it may not have been for the sake of his mother. It may have been for the sake of this this anonymous disciple who called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the one that was next to Jesus at the Last Supper. There may have been more than 12 at the table, you understand, including our Lord. There may have been more than 13. And this is the one whose witness we rely on today for this reading. And he is central in these closing passages of the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, and now it says Mary Magdalene, but the other Gospels remind us that there were other women involved, either one or two, because it was going to be extremely difficult for, for these folks, I'm not talking ugly about you women, but for you all, for the women to roll the stone away uh, from the grave was going to be an extremely difficult job, and also the job itself of working with this dead body and anointing it and completing the burial, which was not completed on Friday evening, was going to be a messy business. And they were in such grief and such sorrow, and yet still they were going off to do, to do this work for our Lord. And... Uh, said that the women uh, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had already been removed from the entrance. So Mary Magdalene came running back to Simon Peter, who was with all of the upper uh, other guys, probably in the upper room perhaps, or they may have been back on the side of the Mount of Olives, but he went running back to Simon Peter and the other disciples uh, including the one whom Jesus loved. This is where we hear this, this indication, this name. And she said, she did not say they have, he has been risen from the dead. Hallelujah, hallelujah. She said, uh, in fear and sorrow, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have put him. She had not gone into the tomb. She merely looked into the tomb and saw this to be the case. So Peter and the other disciple, the other disciple, started to run to the tomb. Both were running. Now, I love these details. I, 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 and, the, and the details are a result of the fact that this is a uh, close to a first-hand account. Now, it's not this young disciple, I say young, guessing, who is writing the gospel, but it is his witness that the gospel writer has included here. Uh, both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the term first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came running behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head 
that was while he was still on the cross, after he died, it remained on his head until they got him back to the tomb, at which point they removed it and rolled it up or folded it up and laid it over to the side. It was not on him as he lay there in death. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and saw this, and he saw the cloths, and the cloth that was still lying in its place, separate, the head cloth, from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw, and he believed. They still did not understand the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. You may guess, since this appears in your bulletin every week, that every sun, every Easter, I'm a shroudy. That's what they call us. Kind of a nasty name for us. A shroudy. Someone was telling me at the Good Friday service where we used the Shroud of Turin fairly extensively and had a large blow up of it, that they had been to a church back in the mid-1980s, not this one, and they had seen at an extraordinary display on the Shroud of Turin, something that looked exactly like it in a light box and a lot of other pictures. I said, yes, I was a part of the group that brought that to the Fort Worth area. We had it here at this church, although these, this couple was not in the church at that, in this church at that time. We were called the Shroud Society of Texas. There's a fancy name for you, for uh, six or seven gentlemen who met uh, once a month to talk about the Shroud and study it. I've studied it uh, for well over 40 years, and uh, I am convinced, regardless of what you've heard about it, that the Shroud is authentic, I saw someone recently, an article in which someone wanted to give us a picture of Jesus. So they took uh, several examples of the faces of several nationalities in the area where Jesus was, and they came up with this funny-looking guy with wide brown eyes and his hair forward and, and chopped, and uh, uh, he, he was really funny-looking. I don't, I don't want to talk about him, but since he doesn't exist, I can talk about him, okay? He's not going to take offense since that guy didn't look like anybody I know, all right? I believe that when you look at this, we're looking at the face of our Lord as it appeared at the moment of the resurrection. This is a photographic negative of the image on the cloth, which is itself like a photographic negative, and you have to take a picture of that negative, and then the negative that is produced gives you this image. This image could not be seen as this is until the invention of the camera. One thing I want you to know today is that when God does a work, God does it thoroughly, God does it completely, and God provides sufficient evidence for anyone who does not fight the truth to believe. God gives sufficient evidence for us to believe the truth about God about life, about where we go when we leave this world. I had a wonderful professor, and I do tell you he was a wonderful professor. I loved him dearly. He was, I think, my favorite professor in Perkins School of Theology. Now, I was, I was an old man of uh, 40 years old when I got back to Perkins, okay, and when I began work in this church. And so I wasn't a kid. Uh, and this, this professor, I, I, I dearly loved him. He gave a lot of insights about Jesus, whom he loved and admired, and he did not think he was raised from the dead. In fact, I still have a paper that uh, this professor wrote called something like the development of the empty tomb hypothesis 
in the early church, the development of the empty tomb hypothesis in the early church. This hypothesis developed slowly in the early church. What actually happened on the day that we call the day of resurrection, uh, the tomb was empty. Someone must have grabbed the guy out of it. The disciples got together and ate a good lunch. And after the lunch was over, they said, oh, I feel a lot better now. I believe, you know, it's almost as if Jesus was with us. Oh, yes, it is, Simon Peter said. Let's just say, hallelujah, he's risen. Let's go tell the world that that's not what happened. Anyway, my dear professor did not believe. In the, and I wonder, you, you, you may wonder why someone who doesn't believe in the resurrection would become a scholar and a teacher of the gospel. There was one time probably when he did believe, but he felt he had gotten too smart. Too smart, too educated. He had learned too much to believe in all of that. But he was still, and everybody is, everybody is attracted to this man Jesus. Everybody, when they get to know him in the scriptures, they say, oh, he was a lovely man. He was a, he, he was a keeper. And that's the way it was with this professor. He loved the things that Jesus said, but there was no good ending to the story for him. It's not because he knew too much. It's because he did not know enough about life, about how life works, about God. And all of the folks out there wandering in the world, and I have a dear, dear, dear friend, and he's going to heaven with all the rest of us. He's a good and gracious person. I love him dearly. He used to be a kid in one of my youth groups who calls himself an atheist. And he has an avoidance mechanism. The only things that he reads are those things which supports his position. When in fact, all of the evidence that anyone needs to believe in the resurrection and to believe in Jesus Christ is obvious, it is clear, and it is before us. When that, when that, when that beloved disciple, whoever he is, bless his heart, and by the way, we will not know till we get to heaven. Uh, when, he, when he looked in there, he believed because what he saw was, he saw the grave clothes still there. Now, he mentions... Uh, the, the winding cloth. Uh, we know that the cloth itself was not wound. What was wound? Well, Dr. John Jackson of the U.S. Space Agency used to work for NASA. He's retired now and spends all of his time working. I'll tell you what he is. He's a shroudy. <laughs> yeah, he's a shroudy. Well, anyway, he has, he has figured out what was done with a three-inch piece of cloth that was cut off of the shroud, okay, and then meticulously sewn back on very carefully. And he says that for the image to be of Jesus, full-bodied image, front and back, to be the way it is, somebody would have had to take like that piece of cloth, which they cut off as they were in the process of burial, and our Lord was in rigor mortis, and they're getting him to lie there like this was not easy. They must have taken that, he said, and, and they said this is necessary for the image. They wrapped that around the outside of the cloth, and they had to have it around his legs to keep them in place and his arms to keep them like that, and they wrapped that around. So, so the way Jesus looked was like, uh, <laughs> kind of like a ship in a bottle or a butterfly in a cocoon. He was there in this cocoon of cloth. And that other piece of cloth was rolled up and laid over to the side. And what the beloved disciple saw was, nobody could have taken the body because the linen was lying there flat with this other wrapped around it and Jesus was simply gone. Now, children, let me say this to you very quickly. Uh, 
I hope you do not have an understanding of the resurrection, which says that Jesus suddenly uh, came back to life and uh, he's, he's as he was again and his heart's beating and uh, he's uh, there uh, and gets up and uh, they have to roll the stone away because he has to get out of the tomb. The apostle Paul tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Of course, he's, he's the king of the kingdom. What happened was that the body, the body disappeared from the cloth. In a moment, in perhaps a blinding flash of light or some kind of uh, uh, quantum physics phenomenon that only God can pull off, but the body disappeared, the cloth fell down upon itself, and it recorded that extraordinary image which also shows not just the outer features, but in a couple of places at the teeth, it shows the sockets of the teeth and the bones of the hands because it fell through them as the body disappeared. And the young disciple looked and he believed. So there is the empty tomb. There is the cloth in which he was buried, which has the image on it. And then there were the appearances. When our Lord does a work, he does it thoroughly, he does it completely, and he gives sufficient evidence for anyone to believe. And if we look at it, the pieces of the puzzle begin to come together. It is not really questionable if you take the time to look. Well, the next thing that happens in the scriptures is that our blessed Lord appears to Mary Magdalene. Now, you may not have noticed in that opening reading the Apostle Paul enlisting the people that our Lord appeared to. He doesn't even mention Mary Magdalene. Mary Teague, I wonder why. Well, because she's just property then. She was just a woman. But the Gospels give her due credit. The first one herself. But I'm not going to read his appearance to Mary Magdalene. I'm going to read the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ to Betty Ware. Is that some famous person? Well, she is to someone sitting down here. It's Cinder Wheelie's, Wheeler's mama. And here is Betty's word. She had lost her dad a year before. And her dad was also her best friend. And it was still hurting. This was 25 years ago, Betty said, a couple of months after my dad died. He had been my best friend, and I was approaching my first Father's Day without him. I was crying and missing him every day. And as I went to bed that night, I was hurting. My husband was already in bed, so I lay down quietly beside him. And just as I lay down, I saw this thing forming in front of me. I say thing because at first I didn't know what it was. It just gradually took the form of a man. And when it did, I could see clearly that it was Jesus. My eyes were closed. I was seeing all of this with my eyes closed, but I certainly was not asleep, and this was not a dream. It was real. Jesus had long brown hair and the most beautiful, intense blue eyes. I can still see those beautiful eyes today. And he was wearing a blue, like a shroud, just the color of his eyes. I call it a shroud because it, it had no opening in the front, no, no buttons or anything. He would have to have put it on through a hole over his head. I guess you would call it a seamless robe. 
And I had never seen fabric like that. Now, Betty explains that she knows fabric because she worked for 18 years in a fabric shop. And it's perhaps only Betty who would notice the fabric that our Lord was wearing in this encounter. When he spoke, his voice was low and it was soft. He said to me, Betty, he called me by my name. He said, Betty, do you know who I am? And I said, yes, you are the Lord. I said this in my mind. I didn't say it out loud. And Jesus said, I have come to tell you that your father is all right. He is with me. And your father and I will be watching over you. And then he began to fade out just the way he had come. I sat up in bed and said out loud, well, how about that? <laughs> I have just seen the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the most extraordinary experience of my own life, I could have said afterward, well, how about that? I have just seen the Lord Jesus Christ. It is important for us to know. He went through a lot of pain for us to know. He suffered intensely for us to know. He wants us to know that he is real. He is risen. There is no power in all of the universe against his grace. There is nothing, nothing that can defeat you and me because of him. And he is here and with us now. Let us turn to him in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we are not what we should be, but we are so much more than we would have been without you. And help us to know this day that we belong to you, that our lives are entirely dependent on your love, and help us to know that we have that love. Amen.